Well, I'm out here in front of the castle. I'm um, going to meet with a man by the name of Scott Britton. He's going to give me some more information about Charles Gates' dolls, who apparently has some type of connection here, so I want to find out what that is. Now well, let's go ahead and go on in. Good to go? Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks, Scott, for helping me out here. I know I'm just trying to gather some information about Vice President Charles Gates' dolls here. Sure. And uh, any information you have uh, regarding his uh, connection here with the castle would be you know, very much appreciated, okay. of course. Uh, first off, here at the Castle Museum, um, we have received as a donation uh, in the past uh, a large collection of items from the Dolls family. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we have what's called the Dolls Room, which has a bed, a nightstand, and a dresser that were hand carved by uh, the Vice President's aunt. Okay. Um, that was uh, donated to us, and we had that for display for folks. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we can take a look at that some point in time? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> and then I um, uh, just want to talk about uh, the, the Vice President in general. Uh, he was born in what's today the Betsy Mills Club, uh, which was actually his mother's house, Mary Gates Dawes. Um, she was a resident of what's now the Betsy Mills Club on 4th Street, and um, was born there. His family was building a house across the street, uh, what's now the, the Washington County Sheriff's Office. Uh, that original house was torn down, but uh, hmm. the remnants are still there of that house. And then they eventually moved up uh, just a block on the other side of the castle, uh, up a little bit farther on, on 4th Street, at 518 4th Street, into the big brick house that is owned by the Hershey family. Was that the, uh, his parents' home? That was his parents' home, uh, okay. yes. His mother was uh, a Gates, uh, the Beeman Gates uh, family. She was one of three children. Uh, she was the oldest of the three. Uh, then she had a, a younger sister, which was Betsy Mills, Betsy mm -hmm. Gates Mills, and then had a, a brother also, uh, Charles Gates, uh, Charles Beeman Gates, which is where the vice president received his name. Hmm. Uh, her brother was killed during the Civil War. Uh, he actually died of injuries that he received in a train accident on his way to the front. Hmm. And um, when she became pregnant uh, after the war was over, their first child was named in her, her uh, deceased brother's honor. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Uh, her, her beloved uh, only brother, uh, Charlie. Uh, so he was born there in the, the Betsy Mills. Building in the parlor, and um, actually, the, the family part of the family was actually having a meeting at their house uh, to form the Presbyterian Church, hmm. which is right down at, uh, at the corner just down from where we're located here at the castle. Hmm, okay. uh, they were having a, a meeting to form the actual church, and he was its newest member. So they, hmm. they formed it that night right. uh, as the baby was being born. Hmm. <laughs> um, his parents were uh, General Rufus Dawes. Uh, general Dawes was a Civil War general, uh, served with the 6th Wisconsin Infantry, uh, which was part of the famous Iron Brigade, uh, fought at the Battle of Antietam, uh, Gettysburg, Spotsylvania. Uh, he was in uh, some of the worst battles in the East hmm. in the Army of the Potomac, uh, and after the war, wrote his memoirs talking about that service uh, called the service with the six Wisconsin volunteers and uh, detail all of those things and one of the great historical narratives of Civil War officers and the life of the Civil War soldier. Hmm. Okay. So. Other questions? Well, uh, how about uh, as far as the council, what tie does he have here? Uh, basically, the tie that, that he has here is um, because we have, uh, we're owned by the Betsy Mills Club. The castle was uh, a private residence until 1991. When the last owner passed away, he deeded the, the property uh, to the Betsy Mills Club, which was originally um, his mother, Charles Gates Dahl's mother's home. And mm -hmm. so there's that connection there. Uh, some of the board members uh, had connections to the Dawes family and donated uh, some of that furniture that I discussed earlier. Mm, okay. uh, we currently have 
as one of our board members uh, for the castle itself, uh, Barb Moberg, uh, who is a retired teacher, and she is the great-granddaughter of the vice president. So we actually have a member of the board that is a direct descendant of the vice president. Is she the only direct descendant still living in the area? Uh, no, there, well, I don't know about the area. There was a number of, of the direct descendants of, of Charles and his other five uh, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a reunion every year, uh, literally hundreds of people mm -hmm. at the reunion. So mm -hmm. you get uh, quite a large family um, from, that, um, from that line. Okay. Well, I uh, think it'd be all right to go check out the, some of the furniture he was speaking of, or? Yeah, uh, it's, it was all hand done by actually his aunt, mm -hmm. uh, Frances, so they call her Fanny, uh, Bosworth Dawes, uh, which was um, the wife of his uncle, uh, Ephraim Cutler Dawes, which is uh, General Rufus Dawes' youngest brother. Uh, Ephraim was also a Civil War veteran. Uh, in fact, he was horribly wounded outside of Atlanta, 64, he was shot through the jaw, uh, lost most of his chin and, and lower lip, had massive reconstruction done on his face, mm -hmm. um, and became a great speaker afterwards. Hmm. His, his speeches were fairly short because of all the pain that was involved in just, just speaking, uh, but he was a uh, pretty well sought after uh, speaker during his time period, uh, lived for uh, roughly another 30 years after the uh, okay. All of those horrible injuries. Um, they never had any children, so they they spoiled their their nieces and nephews, including the vice president and many of those other uh, children of, of Rufus. Okay. Uh, actually, I kind of do have a question about sure. uh, dolls. What, uh, Charles, of course. Yes. Um, do you happen to have you read any of his? Books about the, the, the banking interest in the United States. I know he wrote one about that. He he's written a number of different papers and, and yeah. other things. Uh, he was a pretty prominent banker before even World War One. Right. Before he got involved in the government, uh, he went to law school in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. uh, received his degree and then moved out to Nebraska. Mm -hmm. uh, he became good friends out there. Was involved in banking out there. Uh, became very good friends with General Blackjack Pershing. World War I general of the American forces over in Europe and actually served under him uh, with the expeditionary forces in Europe okay. uh, during World War I. But yeah, he was involved in banking uh, most of his life and then went into the federal service, uh, comptroller of the currency. I have a question about that. Budgetary things, yes. Uh, since, especially since you just mentioned that, of course, I believe that was under President William McKinley. That's correct. Now, uh, from what I understand, President McKinley, he was he was sort of like for the, he supported the gold standard, if you yes. will. Do you know if, uh, I almost imagine that Doss probably would have as well, or? He, or? he did. Uh, there's actually some funny stories surrounding that. His okay. father was a very, very big component, uh, proponent, I should say, of the gold standard. Okay. Uh, he ran for um, representative to the U.S. House of Representatives. Are you referring to Rufus? Rufus. Okay, yes. okay. Uh, General Rufus Dawes. He ran for office in 1880, uh, and that was one of his big platforms, is he wanted the U.S. to go under the gold standard. Were you a Senate for what state? Uh, U.S. House of Representatives for this district, for right oh, here in Ohio. Ohio. Okay, yes. very good. Uh, which I think was the 15th district okay. uh, during that time period. Uh, he ran against another Civil War general from here in Marietta, uh, a gentleman by the name of Adoniram Judson Warner, mm -hmm. who was known as Silver Bill. Hmm. Silver Bill, he was, he was a bimetal um, proponent. He wanted gold and silver standards. Hmm. Um, he was pretty famous in his uh, bimetallism, as they called it, uh, back in those days. So that was a big, uh, big component of the race back in 1880. Hmm. Uh, Rufus won the election. Uh, unfortunately, he was defeated in the 1882 election by uh, General Warner, uh, who went back into office. He, he was the, the uh, incumbent that Rufus beat in 1880. Uh, he regained the seat in 1882 and served another term or two. Um, the, the one funny story that I alluded to earlier, um, in that 1880 election, um, 
the day before the actual election itself, they had a large parade that uh, General Warner had uh, organized as kind of a big rally before the election. And he hired a band and had a whole bunch of his supporters parade around town uh, behind this band going up and down the streets uh, hmm. promoting General Warner's candidacy. And as the story goes, they came up 4th Street and actually came past the Dolls House, uh, just a block up here at, at 518 4th Street. And leading the parade was Charles Gates Dawes, who was playing one of the instruments in the band. He, like a lot of the other band members, were hired to do that. Uh, the, the family was pretty aghast that the son of this gentleman's opponent was the person that was actually leading the band. Uh, <laughs> and they questioned him pretty, pretty extensively when he got home, saying, basically, what, what were you doing leading the band uh, up past our house for my opponent. That is funny. <laughs> and, and he replied that he was paid five dollars. Oh, okay. <laughs> there was a monetary part of that and it was strictly a business deal and they found out that they paid him in a five dollar silver piece mm -hmm. <laughs> which uh, <laughs> they were certainly not happy about uh, but it, it became a funny part of that particular campaign. Now let me ask you about the silver. What, what was uh, the significance of the, the silver aspect? I'm not, I'm not quite as familiar with that particular aspect and, mm -hmm. and that um, part of, of what General uh, Warner was, was proposing. Mm -hmm. uh, on a number of occasions, he wrote different uh, things that are available um, through papers and other things over the years, but I've not gotten a chance to, to read more extensively. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, actually, uh, General Warner and General Dawes met for the first time and became friends uh, the night before the Battle of Antietam. So okay. they were uh, very good friends. Uh, it was a very friendly election. Uh, a staunch Republican in, in Rufus Dawes versus a pretty staunch Democrat in, in General Warner. But it was a very um, congenial uh, election. No personal attacks whatsoever. It was only strictly about the issues of the day. Uh, mm -hmm. It was all about the gold standard versus uh, silver and, and live metal standard. Hey, do you know anything about uh, when, uh, did Charles Dawes, did he not run a, a, I was thinking he ran for a Senate, possibly against William Jennings Bryant? Is that, uh, is that correct? I'm not sure of his opponent. He did run for Senate and was defeated in, uh, in one of the elections right, right. Uh, before he uh, was tapped to become vice president. Uh, he actually had the uh, announcement that he was chosen to be the vice presidential candidate when he was actually here in Marietta. Uh, he happened to be in town mm -hmm. and was at his, his mother's home uh, just right up the street from here when word was received at the house. They had a big imp impromptu speech that they called him out on the front porch to, to talk mm -hmm. about his nomination. Um, he was quite a character, um, very outspoken, uh, very matter of fact and frank. Actually called him Helen Maria uh, Dawes because um, following the the end of World War One, uh, he was called before Congress to report about his activities as one of the chief uh, quartermasters and suppliers of the American Army, and they were uh, arguing about some some things that he had purchased and how much he had purchased them for, and his reply was Helen Maria, we were fighting a war, we weren't. You know, talking about if I could have went out and purchased uh, sheep or mm -hmm. other things to pull the, the artillery, they would have done whatever they did, uh, whatever they needed to do to make sure that the American cause was supported and, and it was successful. So um, yeah, he was, said that they, he would have paid the price of the horse for the sheep if they could have pulled yeah, the artillery to the front yeah, lines. Yeah, uh, something to that effect. Right, right, right. Talking about, you know, they, they had problems with just supplying the, the troops, okay. uh, finding things for the artillery, uh, feeding the troops and things of that sort. Uh, basically, you would pay whatever it took, uh, the going rate, uh, in order to s supply those men and, and make their, uh, their war successful. Yeah, I think during that uh, congressional hearing that you're speaking about, I think the, I think it was the Democrats, they were just trying to make the Republican Party look a little bit bad about that. 
but he wasn't was, going along with that. I don't yeah, think. Yeah, I think there was a lot of politics involved in, in right, some right. of those things, and um, which is you know been the, the norm case yeah. for, <laughs> for many many years. Right. Uh, but yeah, it was it was a way of trying to to nitpick and do some of those things, and right, right. Uh, some of that outspokenness kind of caused a few enemies during his his time of as as vice president. Sure. Yeah. Right. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, or during the inauguration. Okay, okay. Um, maybe one other thing. Um, I know that I think under, was it under Warren G. Harding that he was, uh, the, when he headed up, he was like the Bureau or a Department of the Budget? Yeah, the, I don't remember exactly whether it was Harding, but yes, um, they, were, they were creating new agencies and things of that sort, uh, both with the budget as mm -hmm. well as the Comptroller of the Currency. Okay. Uh, serving in various capacities. After his vice presidency, he was ambassador to England um, and did that uh, position as well. Now, I know that when they, after World War I, and obviously Germany was experiencing the hyperinflation, of course, I know the League of Nations invited Dawes to, I guess, form a committee, I guess known as the Dawes Committee, Correct. to uh, conjure up these uh, plans, reparations payments. Yeah, and that, and really, the the reason why he ended up winning the Nobel Peace Prize was the fact that they they required a huge payment from Germany as reparations for the war, and Germany's economy just wouldn't support some of those mm -hmm. um, those figures that they were throwing out there. So he and, and other members of that commission, including one of his younger brothers, uh, Henry Henry Dawes, was part of that commission as mm -hmm. well. Um, they sit down and they try to figure out a way that was a little bit more realistic for Germany to continue to pay those reparations. Uh, but they were heading toward war at that point, uh, and that was able to stave off some of the um, the war, at least for a little while anyway. Uh, later commissions changed some of those uh, agreements and, and some of those uh, things that the Dawes Commission had put together and eventually led to um, Hitler's rise and Right. Now, I know that um, apparently J.P. Morgan was able to pull some strings during that time. Uh, I know he, play, he placed uh, Alan Dulles on that committee as well. I know J.P. Morgan was right at the heart of the, I'm not sure if you know, have much information about the, the beginnings of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations or not. But uh, I'm not, not quite familiar with that particular okay. part of, of that, that story. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> All right, very good. I'm trying to think of what else. <laughs> well, um, uh, the uh, the Dolls home, the um, the Rufus Dolls home, where he grew up and spent a lot of his childhood, is a private residence now here in Marietta. Um, but he eventually moved not only to Nebraska, but eventually ended up at, out in Evanston, Illinois, mm -hmm. right outside of Chicago. And his home is part of uh, the historical society there mm -hmm. in Evanston. Okay, uh, it's available for tours and. They have staff just like here at the castle uh, to take people on tours, and uh, it's quite a grand mansion. It, it actually kind of reminds me uh, when I went out and visited there a number of years ago. It reminds me a lot about the homes here uh, in in the Marietta area. It looks very mm, similar. Okay. To hmm. Awesome. All right. Well, I think it's. Uh, I don't know if I really have any more questions about. Um, I don't know. Do you think it'd be good to go look at some? That yeah, room. We, can, we can do some of those type of things, and I can um, put you in touch with some other um, contacts as well. Sure. Uh, that might be able to assist you in some future ones. Sure. Hey, let me, I want to get a shot of that book right there. Sure. Um, there was a, a book written in, in 1930 uh, called That Man Dolls by Paul Leach uh, that details some of, um, some of his life. Of course, this was when he was still living. Uh, at that particular point. Um, pretty extraordinary man. Um, actually a very successful family in general. Um, his father, you know, had six children. He was the oldest of the six, but all of them were, were quite accomplished. Uh, another brother, uh, Rufus, um, Rufus Jr., Rufus Cutler Dawes, was uh, one of the organizers of the Chicago World's Fair in um, in the 1930s, um, was also involved in oil and gas out in the Evanston and in Chicago area. Uh, 
as well as the lumber industry here, took over his father's uh, lumber business here in Marietta. Um, another gentleman, Beeman Gates Dolls, was uh, vice, uh, I'm sorry, the president of uh, Pure Oil Company. Mm -hmm. uh, and his other brother, Henry, that I talked about before, who was involved in the Dolls Commission also, was the president of Pure Oil Company. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Beeman also, after he left Pure Oil Company, started the Dolls Arboretum up in Newark, Ohio, mm, okay. up around the Columbus area. All right. uh, and it's a, a pretty, uh, pretty large arboretum and, and a great uh, historical museum and things of that uh, sort with the family there. Uh, he had two sisters, um, Mary Frances and Betsy Gates uh, Dolls. Um, Mary Frances, they called sister, was uh, one of the first two female graduates of Marietta College. So pretty accomplished uh, mm, okay. and, and a great writer, and uh, a younger sister, Betsy, mm. that was also uh, very involved in the family uh, writings and, and other things. Okay. Now I know his, was his, uh, his mother, Dolls' mother, Be Betsy? Uh, her name was Mary. Mary, okay. Uh, okay. Betsy, Betsy Gates Mills, uh, which the, the Betsy Mills Club is named after, was his aunt. His aunt, okay. His mother, Mary, um, was she connected with the college as well? Uh, no, she went to the um, uh, a th a theological seminary in Ipswich, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, so she was uh, educated beyond high school and things of that sort. Uh, but yeah, never, to my knowledge, associated with that. I don't know. Uh, Rufus, however, was a trustee at Marion okay. College for nearly 30 years. All in right. fact, the last couple of years when he was wheelchair bound and, and kind of confined to his home, uh, they thought so much of his advice, they actually had the meetings for the trustees in his home mm, so okay. that he didn't have to travel to the college. Oh, I see. For that. So, uh, yeah, they they had a long association. He he was a graduate of, of Marietta College and um, always associated with the college for, from then on. All right, awesome. Thank you. I think I just got them mixed up a little bit. <laughs> that's, that's quite okay. Yeah.